This is Larry Weissman, and you're listening to Outdoor Adventures with Jason. If you're new to turkey hunting or a seasoned pro, this is the episode for you. Today I'm going to have on Andy Galliano of the Turkey Hunter Podcast. And also make sure to head on over to killingsticks.com to check out some of the finest arrows that are available for bow hunting. And make sure at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time on the Sportsman Channel to check out Cabela's Instinct. Mark Peterson, Tim Harold, and the rest of the guys are putting out some great shows. Stay tuned. Welcome to Outdoor Adventures with Jason. Each week, I bring the world of hunting, fishing, and conservation to you. From the great hunting and fishing opportunities found in the Americas to the dream safaris located on the dark continent beyond, I'll introduce you to those who are already out in the field living every outdoor enthusiast's dream, as well as outfitters and gear manufacturers that can make those dreams your reality. Kill and Sticks Arrows are for the serious hunter, a company that understands the needs of the outdoorsman and provides five different styles of carbon fiber arrows, ranging from hunting to tournament arrows. If you want premium carbon fiber arrows, go to Kill and Sticks, K-I-L-L-N-S-T-I-X dot com to review their carbon arrows. For listeners of the Outdoor Adventures with Jason show, use promo code OUTDOORS to get 10% off your first order. Kill and Sticks, where the blood trail begins. Welcome to this week's episode of Outdoor Adventures with Jason. Really excited today. I've got a guest on that covers a subject that I've got a, a super strong interest in and desire to learn more. And I've got Andy Galliano on. Andy is out of Birmingham, Alabama and runs the Turkey Hunting Podcast. And he has the website IamTurkeyHunting.com. Uh, you'll find links to both of those in the show notes. And uh, Andy, welcome. How are you today? I'm very well, Jason. Thank you for having me on the show. How are you? Oh, I'm great. And I have to tell you, I've been listening to your older episodes. I kind of decided to through the episodes and learning about what's going on with your shows. And, and there's such good content out there that you have. Uh, tell me a little bit about how your your passion for turkey hunting developed. That's a good question and a long story. So I'll try to give you a Cliff's Notes version of that. So I've hunted pretty much my whole life. I have a hard time thinking of back to when I was not a hunter. My dad introduced me to hunting, but he was not a turkey hunter. My dad was a deer hunter and a dove hunter. And when I was very young, a rabbit hunter as well. He had a bunch of rabbit dogs, but I never went rabbit hunting with him. But he did take me dove hunting. That really was, I think, part of what piqued my interest in hunting. And then the trips out into the deer woods, mainly for me at a young age, consisted of taking naps. And I think that's how my dad was able to kill so many deer. From there, pretty much my all of my school years, all the way through high school, I had never turkey hunted. My dad was in the landscaping and garden center business. He owned his own business. And spring times, as you can imagine, in that business are extremely busy. And I grew up working in the spring. And it was not until college when I realized that I didn't have to go to work at the garden center on a Saturday in the spring. Me and one of my buddies that I was in college with our freshman year started asking some of the guys that were in the hunting club that we were in together about turkey hunting, getting curious about it, asking some questions. And next thing you know, my buddy got invited to go with one of them. And then he calls me and says, hey, you're not going to believe that I just went on a turkey hunt. This is so cool. Let's go tomorrow morning. So on a Monday morning, because we didn't have early class, we just ducked out and went down to the hunting club and turkey hunted and didn't do any good. We did hear a turkey gobble several times on the roost, but we didn't know what we were doing at the time. And I, was, I wasn't really all that hung up or or eat up with turkey hunting at that time. But through my years in college, I, I would go three or four times a year a season and actually killed a couple of turkeys. But it was not until I graduated from college and one morning I just decided, well, actually, I guess it was one night, I decided I was going to go turkey hunting the following morning. It was springtime in Alabama and I didn't have any place to go that was close to home. So I jumped in the truck the next morning and went to one of the wildlife management areas. I had no earthly idea where I was on this property. 
I had no earthly idea really what I was doing, even though I knew a little bit about turkey hunting. And I heard off in the distance a turkey gobble. At the time, I could hear, you know, being young. Now I wouldn't been, I think back as, as to how far away that turkey was, and I wouldn't be able to hear that turkey gobble today. <laughs> I heard this turkey gobble, and I kept trying to get closer to the turkey, closer to the turkey. Well, I didn't realize until after about 30 or 45 minutes of trying to get closer to this turkey that we were playing catch. The turkey's trying to get it to me, and I'm trying to get the turkey, and we're passing each other, and we just keep going kind of back and forth and back and forth. So I finally just sat down and started calling, and this turkey absolutely came running in on a dead sprint. And when I think about it, it is, of all the turkeys that I've killed, and it's probably, uh, I'm getting close to 100 now, if I had to guess, turkeys that I've killed. This is the only one that I had that was running into my calling. So he came running into my calling calling and he bit the dust and got to ride back home with me in the back of the truck and of course I took him and showed him off to my buddies and took him over and showed him to my dad and everything else and that is really what fueled the fire in me for turkeys you know looking back on it there's no reason in the world why someone is as, as inexperienced as I was as new as I was to turkey hunting should be able to go onto public land in Alabama and people who hunted all over the country would tell you that public land in Alabama is some of the most difficult land to kill a turkey on and call in this turkey that absolutely was falling all over himself to come to me. So, you know, I kind of look at it and think, well, stars lined up and somebody had a plan for me to get into turkey hunting big time and uh, who am I to fight that plan? So that's what kind of fueled the passion there. Well, and you bring up being in Alabama and I've heard that the birds in that state are pretty, uh, pretty keen on, you know, if they get over two years old, if they get over one year old, public land birds are pretty hip to the game of what hunters are doing and they get get kind of cagey and so it yeah. makes it for a very difficult state of a challenging state to get a public land bird in yeah it is and i do a little segment on podcast that i call the rapid fire q a and what i do in that segment is i'll ask my guest on the show 30 questions and try to get the guest to answer those 30 questions as quickly as i can well they're not questions about what type of subspecies of turkey does X, Y, or Z. It's nothing really biological. It's a matter of personal preference. It's a matter of, you know, if you were sitting down by the campfire at your hunting camp with this person, there are questions that you would ask that person sitting by the campfire. And one of the questions that I ask in that rapid fire Q&A is, what's the most difficult state that you've ever hunted in? Or I think the actual question is, name a state that has the most uncooperative turkeys. And out of all the people that I've interviewed, I bet you 70 to 75 percent of them say Alabama. And then I bet you the other 20, 15 to 20 percent, just rounded up and saying even 90 percent of everybody, but the other 15 to 20 percent of the people say Mississippi. So I think that the birds in Alabama and the birds in Mississippi, they have been hunted since the beginning of time. They've been hunted by coyotes, they've been hunted by foxes, by bobcat, by Indians or Native Americans. I'm not very politically correct, so you have to forgive me there. By, you've been hunt, they've been hunted by the settlers. And so, and there have been turkeys here, and I think that when we travel to these other states hunting turkeys and we hunt these populations of turkeys that have been introduced or reintroduced to certain areas and they've only been there for 20 or 30 years those turkeys don't really have that don't get me wrong they've got a a will to survive and they've got this instinct to survive but they don't necessarily think that they're being hunted every second of every day that they're not in a tree and i think the turkeys in alabama the turkeys in mississippi the turkeys in Georgia, I think that they think they're being hunted, and they are every second of every day that they're on the ground, and a lot of them think they're being hunted when they're in the tree asleep at night because they have this desire to roost over water. Well, why would they roost over water? Because it keeps any predators from trying to get to the tree that they're in. So, you know, they're they're very difficult to hunt, and, and birds, because our seasons are so long in Alabama, our hunting season is, birds get a tremendous amount of pressure on them, on, and that makes them even more difficult. To hunt. So if someone out there listening to the show want a, a huge turkey hunting challenge, then hunting public land in Alabama is where to go for that challenge. And I would say throw Mississippi in there as well. And if you can kill a bird on public land in, in both of those states, you're doing something that I'm going to tell you not very many people in this world have done. Well, and I think that's 
between Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, that's kind of the hotbed for the explosion of turkey hunting across the United States. It all came out of there. Birds have always been there. They've been a long-standing tradition to hunt them. And it was the the famous folks like the backed by the Real Tree and Mossy Oak television shows that I think really put sure. turkey hunting on the map, so to speak, and opened it up to a lot of people that weren't familiar with it. Might have known they had a huntable population of turkeys in their state, but didn't really look at it until you saw somebody like a Michael Waddell or one of these guys get out there and just turkey hunting, turkey hunting, turkey hunting. And I think that really was beneficial for the species because it brings a lot of conservation dollars to them. It does. It does. And, and you can you can throw another state in there and possibly two. I would say Pennsylvania is the same way. There are, are a lot of, I even hate to use the word older because, you know, you have a, a guy like a Michael Waddell who's not old, you know, in my eyes. I'm, I'm probably pretty close in age to him one way or the other, either older or younger. But there are those states, like you mentioned, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and I'll throw Pennsylvania in there, where you have these guys who are in the public eye who have been hunting, turkey hunting, for such a long period of time. They have made a living at it in some shape, form, or fashion, whether that's being a turkey call maker, like the Dick Kirby's of the world, or somebody who gets onto the Realtree pro staff and then has his career explode because of a dynamic personality, being a Michael Waddell, or even a guy like Cus Strickland, who has been a turkey hunter since, I think, the day that he was born, <laughs> who used to run a camera for a hunting show, and now is the face of television for Mossy Oak. And so, you know, you've got these guys out there, and, and a lot of them, so many of them, have come from those three states that you mentioned, but you know, I, I will throw Pennsylvania in there as well. So, you know, that that is so true what you said and and it is a hotbed and it's just something that i think because there were birds in alabama and georgia and mississippi during the time when there weren't really turkeys anywhere else but because there were birds in those three states when there were birds nowhere else in the country well we had people who were hunting them at that time because we had birds in those three states when there weren't really birds anywhere else in the country and so those are going to be your your drivers to help drive the sport across the country and such an exciting sport that really it's made for TV. It is made for TV. If you think about how exciting it is to hear something off in the distance, call to you or just make a call, you work your way towards that animal, find the ideal spot to set up. You call, the bird responds to you. The bird comes into you. It's displaying, thinking that it's coming to a hen and trying to get the hen to come to it. So it's trying to look awfully pretty, and they do. And the bird comes in there, and he's responding. He's gobbling. He's drumming, he's spitting, he's strutting, or if you have decoys out, he wants to fight those decoys, and you get an opportunity at a shot. To me, that is so much more exciting to watch than, God, man, I hate to say it because I love to do it, fishing. It's so much more exciting to watch than deer hunting, which I do, but is, I'm probably going to make some people mad at me. One of the most boring things that I do in my life is sit in a tree stand for three or four hours at a time and wait on the deer to come by. So it's made for TV. And I think when these guys came out and started doing videos, you have your Will Primos of the world. And I'm trying to think of who else was was out there being some of the first ones doing, doing videos of turkey hunting. I think that that really drove interest in the sport. And, you know, today you've got the Outdoor Channel and Sportsman Channel where in the springtime it's hard to turn it on and not see a turkey hunt for that reason because it is so exciting to watch and it's so exciting to do oh yeah and even youtube you type turkey hunting into youtube and it it's just you'll get i think millions of hits of these different styles different types of turkey hunting in it some of it's hunting with a camera some of it's with a bow some of it's with a gun it's just across the gamut it's all of it so it's really really grown I, i grew up in michigan and growing up we didn't have turkeys they were reintroduced early 80s 80s, mid 80s, and I could be off on that date, but somewhere around then. But the, it took a number of turkey generations before there was a huntable population. They peaked. There was a, I mean, they were everywhere a few years ago. Seems like they may have had a little bit of a, a pullback in numbers, but they still have a very strong population. But I, I can see what you say. They, they've been there for 35 years or so. They obviously are smart. They understand that they're being hunted. 
but it's probably a different ingrained okay. instinct from just forever being hammered at like they are where you you are. Right. Yeah, and I haven't had the fortune of hunting turkeys in Michigan yet. I've got quite a few friends that I've made in the turkey hunting world that live in Michigan have invited me to come up there to hunt, and I will get there eventually. But turkey hunting is turkey hunting and I don't care really where you go but there are states where it's just a little bit easier and there are areas within state that it's just a little bit easier. Now a lot of that has to do with population and you know I I say on my show that and, and part of what I try to do on the show is talk about habitat and how to improve habitat so that we can have more turkeys in our hunting land and I say that it's impossible to kill a turkey if you don't have turkeys on your hunting property. It's just not going to be able to do it. I don't care if you take Will Primos with you or Preston Pittman or Eddie Salter or Chris Kirby or Chris Parrish. I don't care how good of a turkey hunter you take with you. If you don't have turkeys on your hunting property, you're not going to kill them. And so when these states and a lot of states across the country are experiencing these this with the population fluctuations, and I think that some of it got to do with just we don't really know what the carrying capacity of these lands are where these turkeys have been introduced because a lot of these lands never had turkeys on them. So you see this population explosion and then it gets to be where there's too many turkeys for what the land can carry, whether that's because of food or water or predators, and then that population starts to shrink a little bit. But where the birds were introduced, if there's a great population, the hunting's easier. It's just easier because you've got more birds, you've got more opportunities. And so, I mean, I know it's stating the obvious and it sounds so silly to even to say it or to hear it, but but I think a lot of times we lose sight of that when we go out hunting and we go on hunting trip, whether it's a paid trip or we're just loading up on a Tuesday morning that we happen to have off work and slip into the woods for a deer hunt or a turkey hunt. And, you know, it's got so much to do with it. I, I asked the question this spring at the NWTF convention in Nashville. I took my microphone and went around from booth to booth and interviewed several high-profile, big-name turkey hunters out there. And I asked one question, the same question to everyone that I interviewed. And the question was, what is the one thing that you learned during your kind of formative years of turkey hunting that took you from being at that beginning or intermediate level of, of turkey hunting to where you are today? What is that one thing that pushed you kind of over the edge to where you were consistently killing turkeys year in, year out? I got a lot of great answers from a lot of very experienced turkey hunters. One guy said to me, access. When I went from hunting and hunting birds that were being hunted day in, day out, and not just by me on one morning. They were being hunted by three or four other hunters in the same morning. When I went from hunting turkeys like that to going to a ranch in Texas that no one had ever turkey hunted, and no one else was going to turkey hunt after I went there, I started killing a lot more turkeys. And he's dead on. I mean, if you don't have access to great hunting lands, you're not going to have as much success as these hunters who do have that access. Yeah, that's huge. I have a friend here here in Texas that has a ranch. They've never hunted turkeys on the ranch. And as many people are aware, Texas has a different setup for hunting than many areas where it's very common to have blinds, feeders, all of that along long cutout paths that you can look down to see the animals move through the thick brush called senderos. He'll have turkeys come out on his property to the blind he's sitting in and he'll just listen to them because they, they carry on like crazy. There's times you could probably reach right out the window and grab one by the neck. They get so close because they're just not afraid necessarily of people because they, they're not hunted, but he's got great habitat for them. There's lots of birds because the, all the habitat development he does for the deer and everything else carries over to the turkeys. And that just benefits everybody around as these turkeys will eventually grow and then go to seek other areas. Um, he, he becomes just a natural breeding ground for turkeys and everywhere around him. Nice to have neighbors like that if you can't do that with your property. It's a nice thing to see and and turkeys are fairly plentiful here. I don't know if they're to the same numbers. Uh, I saw estimates for Alabama of somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five hundred thousand birds. That's a lot of birds. That's a lot of turkeys. I'm going to 
I'm going to say that our wildlife department in Alabama is getting better. But years ago, when I was getting into turkey hunting and joined the NWTF, and the NWTF does their annual edition of their magazine that is their spring edition where they talk about every state in the country that has an open turkey hunting season. They give season date, they give bag limits, they give some of the the highlights of the the regulations and the laws in in turkey hunting. They also list the contact information for the game and fish department. And in some states, they list list harvest numbers and they listed population estimates for those states. And I used to look at that every year and them in Texas would kind of flip-flop back and forth between first and second. And I used to think, wow, that, you know, Alabama's got a lot of turkeys. And if you consider the, the size of Alabama compared to the size of Texas, it really speaks volumes as to the number of turkeys that Alabama has. But the state has no clue. They have no clue as to the number of turkeys that we have because they never really did very many surveys. And when I started to grow my experience level by hunting some of these other states for turkeys, and I would talk to the biologist in those states to try to determine where in that particular state I wanted to go turkey hunting, where the population was greatest, I determined that these other states are actually doing surveys in that they're flying over with helicopters and they're kind of taking surveys and population counts in certain districts and, and gridding that out and trying to say, okay, extrapolate an area, okay, well, we've got this many turkeys in this area and here are similar areas or areas that are similar to it around the state so we can estimate that we have a population of X for our turkeys. Alabama's mostly wooded. You can't get a good population count. You can't get a solid population count by doing an aerial survey in Alabama. So what the state has finally started doing is hunter surveys. Now, they've done hunter surveys for deer and dove for years, but they're starting to do that and have started to do that a few years ago for turkeys. And I'm glad to see that because just like everyone listening to your show, I'm a conservationist. If we don't have the turkeys, we can't hunt turkeys. We can't kill turkeys. And as much as I would love to go out and hunt and shoot every turkey that's out there myself, I know that it's not practical and it's not healthy to do that. So, you know, I've even tried to start managing the turkey population on my properties and not kill every single gobbling turkey that I have on my property now. You know, we've got to manage this resource and part of managing that resource is knowing how many birds we have out there. And I think we've gotten a lot of help over the past several years, too, with some technology with the trail cameras and that kind of thing. So that number that you see of four to 500,000 turkeys for Alabama, it's a straight up guess. It could be 200,000. It could be 800,000. But I think that we do have a large population of turkeys in Alabama. Population, at least in my experience over the past few years, is down a great deal. And there are a number of reasons for that. And we can get into that if you want to. But the even though the population is down right now, I think last year we had a good patch from what I personally am seeing on the properties that I've been on this year, I believe we had a good hatch. And so I'm hopeful that we can get population back up, whether it is to that 400 or 500,000 bird number or that seven or 800,000 bird number, whatever it happened to be when we were at our peak population, I would love to see it get back there because it just gives more of us hunters more opportunities to get out and enjoy the sport. And it gives us an opportunity to, to grow the sport. And if we don't do that, there's, there's our children. Children, our grandchildren and their children are not going to have the opportunities that we have today. Speaking about conservation, the caginess of these birds, the wiliness of these birds, if we use that, let's say, four to 500,000 estimates for birds, and let's just say 500,000, let's be on the north side of that. And I think these numbers for licenses sold maybe from 2015, but Alabama sold 609,000 licenses. So obviously everybody's not successful or else there would be no turkeys left at all that a state can sell, even if it's 400,000, 50% more licenses than there are birds. And Alabama has a fairly generous deal in that you can take multiple birds in any given season, both your fall and your spring, to what is it, five or six birds is the maximum that you can take in a year? Five birds, yeah. So if it's five birds and they sold 600,000 licenses, if everybody was successful, that'd be three million birds. Well, there isn't three million birds in the state. There might be, they don't really know, but highly likely there's not, uh, or you'd be walking across turkeys. So so that speaks to the caginess of these birds, the wiliness of these birds, that they can survive with that many people buying licenses. To me, that's amazing. True. And if you think about it, if the state's selling 650, is it 650,000 licenses? Uh, is that the number you said? It's just over 600,000, like 
nine thousand. Okay, so if the state's selling six hundred nine thousand, and only let's say only ten percent of those people turkey hunt, because in Alabama, when you buy a license, you buy a hunting license, a big game license. It is not well as a resident. I buy a license, and it covers me for shooting doves or squirrels or deer. So there's no distinction between a lot of states where you go and you buy a turkey hunting or you buy a hunting license and then you buy a turkey hunting permit. And I think that gives those states a lot better opportunity to keep up with how many people are actually turkey hunting. We don't have that in Alabama. So let's be conservative. And I'll tell you that being a hunter in Alabama, it's much greater than 10%. But let's just say 10%, only 10% of people that buy a live turkey hunt. So now we're talking 60,000 hunters for turkeys in the whole state. And if each one has the opportunity of shooting five turkeys, now you're talking 300,000 turkeys. And the population is estimated between to be between 400 and 500,000. So even if you're conservative with your number of 600,000 people out there, now you're talking about the opportunity to take over half the population of the turkeys that are out there, being 300,000 opportunities for turkeys with a population being 500,000. It still is strong and it speaks to what these birds have to do to survive. I mean, it's crazy. And it's not just these licenses that are being sold because they're still being hunted by bobcats and coyotes and hawks. And they're being hunted by crows and raccoons in the South and really over pretty much the entire South. Fur prices for a Southern animal are nothing like what they are for a Northern animal. So trapping in the South has been dead for years, decades, whereas trapping in the North still has some legs behind it. So these predators in the, in the Northern part of the U.S. are being kept down a little bit. But the predators in the Southeast, people just don't get out and trap. There's no benefit financially in doing it, even though we know there's a benefit to our wildlife, both the deer and the turkeys and the quail and every other critter that we want to hunt. But the turkeys in the south, they're, they're just being hunted all the time. So, yeah, they're, they've they got a lot of pressure on them. They certainly do, you know, just from us hunters. Yeah, they, they're going to get it from the, before they hatch all the way through to the meet their meet their maker. They've got somebody hunting them. Very true. Let's switch gears a little bit here. I, I'm a brand new turkey hunter. I've, I've gone turkey hunting one day in my whole life. And so, yeah. if I've if I get on and listen to your podcast and you're talking to new hunters, uh, and, and let's just say shotgun hunters to, to keep it simple because that's what your forte is, What where do you start? What do you do? What do you look for for equipment? Yeah, that's a great question. So I did a survey back in January and I learned that about half of the listeners to my show are new or new-ish turkey hunters being three years or less experienced turkey hunting. So I try to give a good mix of topics on the, on the podcast knowing that because I don't want to just stay into advanced tactic when I've got hunters who are brand new listening to the show. So we do cover some of that. I actually did an episode on what's in my turkey vest. So where do you start? Well, you absolutely have to start by having hunting property that has turkeys on it. We talked about that, so I'm not going to go into that in any more detail. But whether it's public land or it's a hunting club, and the trick is here, if it, well, if it's public land or private land, being the hunting club, just because it has turkeys during deer season does not mean that the turkeys are going to be there during turkey season because the turkeys are going to change what they're looking for, and that's food. Those food sources change throughout the year. So if you have an area that has that you're hunting that a lot of hardwood and it has had a good mast crop in any particular year, you may have turkeys in there in the fall. But that does not mean that between the deer and the hogs and the turkeys and the squirrels and chipmunks and everything else that eat those acorns and the other mass that's fallen on the ground, that does not mean that those turkeys are going to be there in the spring eating the same food source. So they're going to move on. They're going to be looking for bugs and higher protein food sources as the weather starts to warm up and as they start to breathe. So number one, turkeys. So I mentioned trail cameras. That is the best scouting tool that we could ever have because it's in the woods when we're not. So if you have turkeys in the fall or the winter and you want to know if you have turkeys in the spring, trail cameras and check them. Don't make them mistake that I do. I like to set up my trail cameras and then check them like once every four months. Don't do that. So make sure you've got turkeys. Number two is, even though I, I did an episode of what's in my turkey vest, there's a lot of stuff that was in my turkey vest that a new hunter does not have to have. So I'm not going to say that you've got to have every product that's being sold on every TV 
Wendy's show, in every magazine, in every on every podcast out there, what I'm going to tell you is you got to have a shotgun if you're going to shot, hunt with a shotgun. Of course, if you're going to hunt with a bow, obviously you've got to have a bow, you've got to have arrows. You've got to have the right equipment for your quarry. If you're hunting turkeys with a shotgun, there are so many incredible choices and options available to us today with chokes for our shotguns that are specifically for turkeys and shotgun shells that are out there today that are specifically for turkeys. And the technology that has gone into those two items, those two products today is mind-blowing. When you consider the fact that a hunter can consistently and without question take turkeys today at 50 yards with a gun that shoots properly to be able to do that, and you look back 20 years ago in the maximum range that you would even think about, that you would even think about squeezing the trigger on a turkey is 40 yards. Now, 10 yards doesn't sound like a lot, but again, I'm hunting these tough Alabama birds that 10 yards is everything. It's everything. It's the difference between having meat in the freezer and not. So having the right equipment is, is key, but you don't have to go and buy everything out there, like I said. Focus on finding the right turkey choke for your shotgun and the shells that shoot best out of that. That involves a lot of time at the range, which if not work, that's some of the most fun time that I get to spend doing anything. I love to shoot, whether it's shooting rifles or shotguns or my pellet gun in the backyard. Yeah, I still do that. It is so enjoyable to get out and shoot a gun. So get out there and shoot several different choke combinations in your gun, several different shotgun shells out of each one of those chokes. Find the combination that works best in your gun to give you the best pattern. And so what is the best pattern? The best pattern is at, let's say, 40 yards. We want a 10-inch circle drawn on a piece of paper. And I do not recommend just using a 10-inch pie plate because you're going to not be able to see where the center of your pattern is. Uh, someone who's on the range shooting their shotgun to pattern it needs to probably go to an office supply store or a local drugstore and buy some poster boards. Some of the, what are they, two feet by three feet. I don't even know what size of a poster board is. But the size, something the size of a poster board and put a 10-inch circle in the center of it. Put a dot, whether it's an inch circle or just a dot, whatever they need to be able to see that dot in the center of that 10-inch circle at 40 yards. And they need to sit down with a rest like they would if they were shooting and reciting in their rifle. And they need to aim at that dot that's in the center of that 10-inch circle with that gun. Shoot. And they want to see which of those shells is putting the most pellet in the 10-inch circle, which one of those shells is putting the center of that pattern of those pellets as close to that dot that's in the center of that 10-inch circle. And they need to look at which of those shells has the fewest gaps in the pattern of those pellets hitting that entire sheet of poster board. So from there, then I'm going to say, well, actually, I'm not going to say from there. I'm going to say while someone is, is doing that, they need to be learning everything they can learn, whether that's listening to my podcast or going on YouTube and watching videos or just going to some different websites out there. I'm going to tell you that, and it, it's no different from turkey hunting than it is any other kind of hunting, whether it's deer hunting or whatever it happens to be. There is some BS out there. So we have to be careful about our information sources. And there are people who are out there who claim to be experts who are not. And we have to be careful about what we learn from those people. The good thing about turkey hunting is that there is no one right way of doing it. So we don't necessarily have to discard everything that we hear, but we don't want to take everything that we hear as the gospel truth either. So consider your sources. I would tell you, try to find information from some of these guys who have been turkey hunting for 40, 50 years, and there are a lot of them out there. There's a lot of Harold Knight and David Hales and Preston Pittmans and Eddie Salters and Cus Strickland. There are a lot of them out there who are more than willing to give information. So learn everything you can learn about this is so important. I can't stress it enough. Learn everything that you can learn about wild turkey. Then start to pick up on, okay, what can I do to kill a wild turkey? If you learn everything that you can learn about wild turkeys, you're going to know what you need to do to kill turkeys. You don't have to be the best caller. In fact, you can go and hunt turkeys without turkey calls and kill turkey. If you know where the turkeys are, if you know where they're feeding, if you know where they're roosting, what they're doing from daylight to dark, from fly down to fly up. You know what they're doing during those times. You can kill turkeys. So it's extremely important to know the turkeys and then start to work on some of the finer 
hunter details. People get so focused in them. New hunters get so focused in on the calling aspect. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me whether it was after I started the podcast or before I started the podcast. I just don't turkey up because I, I just can't figure out the calling part of it. Forget the calling part of it. Learn the wild turkey. Learn how they're using your property. Learn why they're using your property. Once you know that, killing a turkey becomes so much easier than the calling. Now let's talk about the calling. So really, all you need to do to kill wild turkeys to call in a wild turkey and kill it, I'm going to say there's two calls. That's all we need to worry about. One of them is so easy, I can give a call to a four-year-old kid, and in three minutes, that four-year-old can make this one sound on a pot and peg call, or as a lot of people call on a slate call. But I, I can give them that call, and in a matter of minutes, that four-year-old can be making the sound perfectly well enough to call in a gobbler, and that's the clock. Luck is... I was just going to say, that person that learns that cluck, is that cluck the same across all the turkey species, subspecies? Fantastic question. Yes. The wild turkeys in the U.S., and I'm going to throw the goulds in there. So the goulds, the Osceola, the Eastern, the Merriams, and the Rio Grande all have the same vocabulary. Okay. The turkeys that they have in deep in Mexico in the jungle, which is the oscillated turkey, it has a different vocabulary. So we don't want to worry about that one. We're not going to walk out of our back door and hunt that turkey. No, you're going to have somebody with you helping you on that one. That's exactly right. So the ones that we're going to be hunting most readily, most easily are going to have the same vocabulary and that cluck is going to be the same. And a lot of people, I think when they first start hunting, they confuse a cluck with a putt. And there's a very distinct difference between those two calls. The putt is an alarm call. And if you make a putt sound in the woods when a wild turkey is around, you will get that turkey's attention in a heartbeat. If you make a cluck sound or if you hear a cluck in the woods, that is is more of a locator call for turkey and that lets one turkey know where another turkey is and gobblers do it hens do it all turkeys make the cluck sound now a gobbler's cluck is going to sound a little bit different can be a little bit deeper than a hen's cluck and, it, and the volume can be anything i mean it could be loud or it could be soft but with that one call you can let male turkey know where you pretending to be the hen are and that's often all you need to get the turkey to come in. The other, the second call I would say that new hunters need to focus on learning is just the basic or plain yelp, and that's going to be anywhere from three to seven notes. It's, it, I'm going to do it with my natural voice, so uh, at least it'll be a good laugh for everybody because I'm not a great natural voice caller. <laughs> There's some great ones out there, but it's kind of a <laughs> So what we need to learn in perfecting that call is the cadence of that call. That's the one thing that's consistent from listening to a lot of different hen turkey, the one thing that is most consistent in a in yelp is the cadence between those yelp, or key yelp, as a lot of people will say. So between each yelp, that cadence, that's what is consistent, that's what makes a good yelp. And, you know, I still hear people say it all the time because it's so true. Some of the worst turkey calling I've ever heard has been from a turkey. <laughs> a live, wild turkey. And so that tells you you don't have to be great at it. And I'll tell you this quick story just kind of because it kind of proves the point. So I deer hunted with this guy in Iowa and had a great time deer hunting with him. He learned I'm a huge turkey hunter. He invited me to come up and turkey hunt with him. And I did. And I went up there and the first day he said, well, I want you to, I want you to go out with my son today. He's going to kind of show you the land and just kind of show you where everything is. I'm sorry. I've got to go into work. I just I have no other choice. I said, no big deal. We'll go out. We'll have a good time. I went out not expecting anything really. We walked out about 200 yards from his house and his son's with me and he said there's usually turkeys down in this bottom down here so i took out my, my pot and peg call and i made in my mind and I, i'll tell you very honestly i am an average caller but i made in my mind what was the most beautiful series of yelps that i've made nothing silent so we're standing there and we're listening and we're you know just talking a little bit back and forth with one another not a whole lot and i said well do you want to try it and the kid says yeah i'll try it he's probably 12 at the time and he got that pot and pig call in his hand and he makes what sounds like one turkey getting murdered <laughs> by another turkey. And it was it was this horrible sound that I'm not even going to try to duplicate with my mouth. It was so bad. And a turkey gobbled down in the bottom. And he said, did you hear that? And I said, yeah, give me the call. Take the call away from it. So you just... <laughs> 
you don't have to be the, the best at turkey calling. And I, as, as average as I am at calling, kill a lot of turkey. And it's not because of the calling. It's because I'm a good hunter. And I focused on learning what turkeys do. And I think that's one of the driving forces for me as to why I enjoy turkey hunting so much is because I'm always looking for stuff when I'm in the woods. Whether it's turkey signs, turkey sign in the in the leaves, or you know, whether it's scratching for food, or turkey tracks, or dust bowls on the edge of fields, whatever it happens to be, turkey scat, you know, I'm looking and I'm constantly using my brain trying to figure out what is that turkey doing right now? What is a turkey doing right now? Or what was a turkey doing in this spot a day ago, or five days ago, or ten days ago? What are they eating? Why were they here? Are they going to come back? And to me, that involvement is, I think, part of what really drives me to, to get back out and, and chase turkeys and keeps me interested in them so much. So, you know, don't, as a new hunter, don't focus on the calling all that much. Learn turkeys. And I, I want to throw this out there. I, I am a huge fan of this book. And if I had a dollar for every time I've mentioned this book on the podcast, well, I'd have several dollars. But <laughs> the book is Illumination in the Flatwoods. And it's written by a man named Joe Hutto. And he is a wildlife biologist. And the book is not just about, well, it is. It's, the book is 100% about turkeys, but it's not a typical turkey book where someone's giving strategies or something like that. Joe Hutto has in the past and is still today someone who has imprinted and who imprint young wild animals. And in saying that, if people are not familiar with that term, he basically is making himself their mother at such an early age that they don't know he's not their mother. He is their mother. He got these eggs. And he actually got two clutches of turkey eggs from a local landowner or rancher, whoever it was. He was in Florida at the time. And he put them in an incubator. And from the time that those turkeys started to come out of the, the eggshell, to come out of the egg, he called to them. And the very first thing that they saw when they came out of the egg was him. And when he's talking to them in their language as they're coming out of the shell, he's instantly at that point has he's become their mother. So without telling the whole book, he raises these baby turkeys. And the book is basically his diary from day one through the time that he gives up this project. And it was a two-year-long project. Think about the commitment that that took, both from him and his wife at the time. I mean, that's a huge, huge commitment. And he writes about it in this book. So you get, in the book, you get not only the story of him raising these turkeys, these wild turkeys, and he lets them be wild. He doesn't keep them in the pen, you know, in a pen and in a cage and make them tame domestic turkeys. He keeps them wild. He goes into their world because he understands the importance of keeping them wild. But we get not only that story in the book, but we get to learn a lot about wild turkeys. And a lot of the stuff that we learn or can be learned from the book doesn't just jump out at us. It's stuff that we have to really kind of read between the lines. And one of the things that I picked up in the book is, and it's something that I never really even thought of until I, I read this, but he mentions that there's this particular little area on his property that is along a creek that runs through the property, and that that area is, is shaded. It's a very pretty area, and that area typically will stay about two or three degrees cooler than anywhere else on the property. And he said that that's the spot that the turkeys enjoy the most on his property. So he would take them out and they would go on walks and, and they would you know spend the time from, from or spend time from the point that they flew down in the morning and they would spend the entire day together and that the turkeys would go into this one area and they would load and they would stay there for hours. So it makes perfectly good sense. There are spots in the woods on the properties that I hunt and the properties that I own that I just enjoy walking in there and just sitting and I can sit there for hours. And in that respect, they're not much different than us. And I don't think that, you know, the wild animals that we hunt are terribly different than us for the most part when it comes down to that, that basic instinct. So 
I'll throw that book out there. There are others out there. I just enjoy the story. It's it's an incredible book and highly recommend that to everyone. So learn your your firearm, what works best in it while you're learning wild turkeys. Hopefully you already know your hunting properties and where the birds are because you've got your trail cameras up. Work on a cluck, work on a yelp. You can take your camo and you can put it in the closet. There's been so many turkeys killed with blue jeans <laughs> and a red and black or blue and black plaid shirt that we can't even count. Same thing with deer. But camo is definitely going to help you. Don't get me wrong. But Well, it's like know, watching those old of- Fred Bear videos when he was out there hunting and he'd be in a, a wool coat, a fedora type hat and, you know, a pair of work pants not a stitch of camo in his bow and it'd be hard pressed to tell an animal that he didn't take with a bow and it wasn't because of camo yeah mere feet from them you know the camo is great i don't i don't mean to sell it short because it's awesome you and i talked a little bit about that before you you pressed record but it's the camo is wonderful use it but don't focus on that don't focus so much on the products Focus on learning the animal and what makes them tick, where they want to be, what they want to do, what they're eating, and then know your equipment that's huge. Know how close that turkey has to be to you before he's in range. And, you know, I would tell you if you've got a very nice-looking pattern at 40 yards, shoot it at 50. Make sure that the pattern doesn't disintegrate or fall apart between 40 and 50 yards. It doesn't sound like much. It's just 10 yards. It's just 30 feet. But at some point, continue out between 50 and 60, between 60 and 70. At some point, that 10-yard area is going to make the difference between your pattern being very good and very solid and very consistent to just being garbage that you wouldn't sh- a dove at that distance. So, you know, that if it shoots well at 40, shoot it at 50 and see if the pattern is still looking good and if it does then i think within reason we can say with today's turkey shells that you can consistently kill a turkey out 50 yards with that particular choke and that particular shell and in your particular shotgun so you know the equipment's important a lot more important than than i think we than a lot of hunters new hunters think that they think well i can just take my dove gun out there and put a choke in it and buy a box of turkey shells right off the shelf and just go out and hunt turkeys and kill a turkey chances are they can but hopefully they wouldn't go and buy a rifle throw a scope on it throw some rings and bases and a scope on it buy a box of shells and go straight to the woods with it hopefully they're going to foresight that rifle they're going to shoot a couple of different types of shells in it at the range and know where that gun is hitting and sight the scope in accordingly before they go out into to hunt deer or hogs or whatever it is that they're going to hunt so do the same thing for turkeys a shotgun is not a shotgun they're not all the same they're not all going to shoot the same and each choke is going to shoot the same shell differently each shell is going to shoot out of the same choke differently so it's important to try all of those and know know your equipment so has that helped you at all it has and i think i think i'm like a lot of new hunters in that you get to look in at these big box stores at the number of different calls that are out there and you're almost paralyzed by what do i do because you see these guys on tv the men and women doing these calls and as you said they're better than a lot of turkeys and you're going do i get a box call do i get a slate call do you know do i get a mouth call and and by the time you're done you're like forget it i'm going deer hunting because (laughs) yeah I'm glad you brought that up. That you're right, and it's something I didn't really touch on. I did. I touched on calling, but I didn't touch on the different types of callers. And as a beginner hunter, I personally think that the easiest type of call to learn to use is what's called a push pull call or a push pin call. Some people will call them, and it's just a, a simple box design that has a peg that comes out the end of one side of that box, and and you just move, push that peg in to make a turkey sound. So you can make that, that push-pull call. You can make it yelp. You can make it cluck. You can make it purr. It can do really almost any type of call that you're going to use, that you're going to use spring. And it is so easy. You literally can work it with one hand, hold the call in one hand, and work that call with one finger. That, to me, is the easiest type of call to use. And if I were starting out today as a new turkey hunter, that's what I would pick up first. I would master it. And the good thing is, it's not a call that everybody uses today and turkeys don't hear them that frequently but because they're so easy to use 
and easy to learn. I think a lot of experienced hunters don't use them. And a lot of times you can use a type of call because it, it has its own unique sound that no other call sounds like. If you work a box called in the woods and you're 50 yards away from me, I can just about, I would say, eight times out of 10, I can tell you that that's a box call that you're worth. I'm not even a turkey. So I think these different types of calls all sound similar. Turkeys get used to hearing them. They get used to hearing box calls. They get used to hearing pot and bag calls, even though there are tons of different combinations of pot and bag calls out there that each has its own unique sound. They get used to hearing diaphragm calls or mouth calls, as people call them. And that push-pull call a lot of times is a little bit different than all those other types of calls, and it's something a turkey hasn't heard. It's unique. And a turkey will, and it and it makes a good turkey sound. A good push pull call makes a great, very good turkey sound. And so, a, a male turkey will come looking for you with that call. That's what I would use today if I was starting over. For listeners, uh, you can go out to iamturkeyhunting.com, and I'll have a link to this in the show notes. Uh, Andy's got a store section that lists tons of different items, uh, so you can go and peruse through and see what the different calls look like and uh, certainly purchase directly from there as well. You can access his podcast, some different tips and stories that he's got out there. So there, there's really a lot of information uh, that's applicable to birds, not just in Alabama, but primarily, well, terrain might be different in, say, Nebraska than Alabama. If you're telling me the clucks all sound the same, their actions and, and movement should be, or I would think might be similar as well. And, and if you're out of state, you're probably hunting with a guide who's going to be a better versed at what that ha- local habitat's like. Yeah. That, that is, a turkey is a turkey is a turkey within the, the borders of the U.S. And they are going to do different things. You know, they're, they're going to eat different foods because different food sources are available in Alabama than what's available in Nebraska. I mean, okay, a bug is a bug, but there are different types of acorns. There's different types of greenery, whether that's grass or weeds or whatever it happens to be. So the birds are going to eat different things. So, you know, that's why I was saying learn learn the birds first and learn the birds in your area. What are they doing? And that, you know, that's very important. And that's really the difference. The terrain and is what you said, where these turkeys live is the one real big difference. Where they live, what they eat, what they do from the time they fly down in the morning until they fly up in the afternoon, that is the one big difference. The language is the same. And, you know, that's the easy part. I know it sounds like it's the hard part, being a new hunter. And that is, you know, at least what I thought I struggled with in my mind was the calling part of it. But I put way too much emphasis on that when I first started out. And I think a lot of hunters do. So that terrain, learning what they do, if a new hunter will learn that, the success level is going to go way up. But there there are, we talk about on the podcast several different subspecies and some of their tendencies because they, they have things that they like to do that are different from subspecies to subspecies. But they're primarily minor thing. You know, I'll, I'll throw one out there because you mentioned Nebraska. Nebraska has a great population of wild turkeys. They have a great population of Merriam's wild turkeys, which I think are some of the prettiest ones out there. They have the white tips on their primary feathers on their tail, and they're just absolutely gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous animals. And Merriam's travel a great deal, more so than eastern turkeys, which are primarily east of the Mississippi, even though there are some west of the Mississippi. But eastern turkeys have a, they do travel a little bit, but they have a home range that's fairly small, relatively small. A Merriam's wild turkey has a huge home range to where it can be 20, 30 miles, and they're traveling because of weather, water, and food. So we do talk about some of those differences in the subspecies on the podcast, and, and that's the thing. You know, <laughs> I've had people say, your show's only about wild turkeys? Well, don't you run out of stuff to talk about? No. I, I may at some point in time, but there's all always something to talk about with wild turkeys because there's so much to them. You know, whether it's habitat management or just what we were talking about, let's talk about Miriam's wild turkeys today. Well, okay, that doesn't appeal to someone who lives in West Virginia who only hunts eastern wild turkeys. But I don't have listeners that are only in West Virginia. And not only that, but that hunter in West Virginia is just as 
likely because he has a desire to go and, and hunt a grand slam of wild turkeys, which is to kill one of the subspecies, each of the four subspecies in the U.S. that we have. I didn't throw in the goulds because the goulds, if you kill it with the four spe- subspecies that we had in, have in the U.S., it is not part of the grand slam, but part of a different slam. And, you know, kind of getting a little too technical. But that hunter in West Virginia very likely has a desire to go kill a grand slam, and he's going to need a Merriam wild turkey to do that. And Nebraska is a great place to do it. So let's talk about some Merriam's turkeys and their their habits and their tendencies and what makes them a little bit different than an eastern turkey or a Rio or an Osceola. So, you know, I try to I try to cover so much of that just to, to keep the show interesting, to talk about some different topics, but there is so much of it out there to cover that since the show is, is just on wild turkeys, I can. Yeah, there's a there's a whole series of information. You know, like you said, just learning the birds can you can spend your whole life doing that. You can see a guy spent two years actually delving right into living with them from the book you you were talking about, uh, Illumination in the Flatwoods. So they're an interesting uh, interesting thing. Now I really appreciate all the time you've given me. Tell listeners what's the best way to find your podcast. Yeah great question. So just depending on what podcast player they use, probably the easiest way to find it is if you're on a mobile device, pull up a podcast player there and search The Turkey Hunter. And if they'll search that, it should pop up. If it doesn't, then go to Google and type in The Turkey Hunter and the podcast should pop up from there. It's on the majority of the podcast players that are out there available for download on a mobile device. And should readily come up. I know it's on iTunes. It's on the big ones. It's on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Player FM. It also can be found on the Outdoor Podcast channel. So if you cannot find it, if you cannot find the Turkey Hunter podcast on your using your podcast player search function, then you can also search for the Outdoor Podcast channel, and and the show's part of that awesome lineup of shows as well. Which I'm sure Jason, you've talked about that on an episode or two, but it's a great avenue for most of us hunters out there who do hunt more than one type of critter or those of us out there who are just outdoorsmen and outdoors women who not only like to hunt but we like to fish there's a little bit of all of that on the outdoor podcast channel where we can get a different show covering a different topic every single day and some days we get a different show in the morning and in the afternoon so it's really cool to be able to do that it's exciting to to be a part of that and you know that's something that is fairly unique in the outdoor world and you know with other podcasts other i guess genres of podcast if if i can use the term that's something that's pretty common but in the outdoor genre of podcast that's something that's not very common to be able to go out and, and have one channel where you can pick up so many different topics whether it's fishing or hunting and so many different shows and it's a a great place to get a bunch of content in one spot it's very exciting to be a part of that i i like to use my show but to really present a broad overview to then find what may trigger somebody's so when I find that person that's doing something really unique in the outdoor industry, I can't be the only one that's interested in that. So any way I can give additional exposure to that and learn from it and get a cool, you know, a few cool takeaways, it's a win-win across the board for everybody. So I really, again, I really appreciate the time this morning. Just this little bit that we've talked and the amount of good quality information you've provided is for the listeners, go out and get his podcast. Listen to the Turkey Hunter podcast. It's absolutely filled with so much good information. I had never thought about hunting turkey in Alabama. Now all my mind is sitting there going, if I'm going to do a Royal Slam, I got to have an Alabama Eastern bird to make that legit. You know, there's so much really cool content that you've provided for everybody for these last three plus years that you've been doing this, Andy, that... I wish you luck and I don't see an end to this because there's just so much stuff that comes down the pipeline and so many things to to encourage or discourage in the field of turkey hunting. I appreciate the kind words about the show. You know, it's it's something as you can tell because I can't shut up when I start talking about it. It's <laughs> something that I'm very very passionate about. I just absolutely love it. 
I mean, there is, to me, there's just nothing better. I'm, I'm not going to start talking about it again because I'll go for another hour and a half, and I know you don't have the time for that. And I probably, in the real world, don't have the time for it, even though in my mind I always have time for it. But, you know, I just, I've enjoyed it. It's been fun. I've met so many awesome people from hosting the show, and I started the show because I really didn't want new hunters like yourself to struggle as much as I I did when I first started because I told somebody this. I said, if you want someone to lie to you, if you want to hear a lie, come out of somebody's mouth, talk to a turkey hunter <laughs> because they want every turkey for themselves. They don't want to share a whole lot of information about their sport with people who are new to the sport, especially if they're going to share hunting land with them. Now, all of a sudden, they're sharing their turkeys with that new hunter, and that new hunter is going to steer turkeys. Any hunter is going to scare turkeys and that scaring becomes educating and I just didn't want I don't want the sport of turkey hunting to die if we don't introduce new hunters to the sport that is exactly what's going to happen. We can't have that. And so that's why I started the show. And I try to remember that there are just as many people listening to my show who are new to the sport as there are people who have been doing it for 30 or 40 years. And so there's a good variety of topics out there. But yeah, there's always something to talk about with it. And Jason, I just appreciate you having me on the show. If you want to tackle that slam of wild turkeys and you want to put an Alabama bird on that list of Eastern or to satisfy that requirement for an Eastern turkey. I know somebody that might be able to to go out in the woods with you. I don't know that we can do any good, but I can at least run around out in the woods and scare turkey. I do know I'm good enough to do that. Well, I'm great at that. I always say the first time I went turkey hunting, there was only one turkey in the woods and that was me. (laughs) I would love to. I have only driven through Alabama once, never realizing how actually forested the state was in listening to you talk about the caginess of the birds and and realizing the history. And I think that's one of the big things is as you're as I'm getting into turkey hunting, I'm realizing the history and the the background of this and thinking, okay, if you're going to stand there with the big boys, so to speak, and you're going to put up these birds, it's great to take an eastern turkey in any state. Any state you go to and spend your hunting dollars is great, but there's something special about that Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi trifecta to get a bird out of one of those states. I agree with you. Yeah, you'll definitely be, uh, I appreciate that. You'll be hearing from me because we'll figure out a way to, to do that. And then again, I appreciate your time. For the listeners, go check out Andy's podcast. This show is just, I can't tell you about the amount of good information that Andy has on there, both from himself, and you can hear it through this show, his passion, his love for turkey hunting, and just hunting itself, but the guests that he has on. The list of guests is a who's who in the turkey world. So check out the show check out his website, look in the show notes for this episode to find links for the uh, different spots you can uh, hit up Andy's different content. And you can contact him directly through his website if you have any questions. That's just been awesome. I've I've loved having you on, and I appreciate this coming on here and sharing all these great ideas with my listeners. Thank you again, Jason. I really appreciate the opportunity. Like I said, I always love talking turkeys, and it's good talking to you as well, and I enjoy your show and what you're doing with it, and keep that up. I love the variety in it. Well, thank you. Your interview is fantastic, so I've I've enjoyed listening to the interviews that you have on there. It's always fun. You have a great afternoon. Thank you. You do the same, Jason. Thank you. Come early spring, it's getting green Fisher on the bed And hear those turkeys gobble It's ringing in my head The winter rise bass boat Here comes another year Yeah, we command the outdoors around here Oh, we command the outdoors Yeah, we command the outdoors Come summertime, we're feeling fine Fishing on the lake Flipping jigs and Carolina rigs From early morning till real late 
Bonfires on the creek bank, kick back a couple beers. Yeah, we command the outdoors around here. Yeah, we command the outdoors. Yeah, we command the outdoors. Next year's does until you know winter's on the way. Brushing blinds and deer stands. The fever starts to creep. Fill our freezers full of ducks, lots of tender deer. Yeah, we command the outdoors around here. Yeah, we command the outdoors. Yeah, we command the outdoors. So grab your guns, shells, boys. Put on your camouflage. Cause we command the outdoors around here. We command the outdoors.